God, we thank you tonight. We put our trust in you. No matter what the circumstances are, we won't be moved off of our trust in you. We might not understand what's going on. We may not be sure what's happening, but we do know this, that we trust you. And in that trust, we see you provide the answers. Father, we thank you tonight for Pastor Sarah. We thank you that you have literally given her to us as a gift. She is your gift to the church. And so, Father God, we humble ourselves and we agree to submit to the word that we hear tonight. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight, we are going to be in Genesis 11. So if you have your, I'm going to turn it now so that we'll, oh, right away. Look at that. So Genesis 11, and we are going to talk about the fun, fun subject of rebellion. Yay! <laughs> I think we've all been rebellious at one time or another. Yeah. Okay, let's pray though while you're turning there and getting there in your Bibles. Father God, we thank you. And as that last song said, we indeed can trust in you and who you are and the calling that you have placed on our lives. And so, Lord, as we delve into the topic of rebellion, we just thank you. That you are a God who redeems the rebellious when we turn our hearts towards you. So open our hearts and open our minds. And Lord, may we experience you in this time that we have in your word. We give it over to you and say, have your way, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. That's what we all say to our friends on a Friday night, right? Take <laughs> them over to my house, let's make bricks. Let's make bricks. <laughs> they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches up to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Did it turn? No, sorry. I'm on verse 6. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because they, there the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And this is the word of the Lord. And it did change. Yes. Okay, so the human race, meaning you and me and everybody in this room, um, has always we always seem to long for more, right? You ever get what you want, and then you get like a new car, or you get something, and then after a while, the new car smell goes away, or the TV screen doesn't look as good as it did when you first brought it home, and we we lust for more, we want more, and we chase after the things of the world, and we lose sight of what really matters. And and here in this particular text. I'm hesitant to turn it back a screen because I don't know if it's going to move. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. I found this is a total rabbit trail and something you can study in your home, but I found it really interesting that, that it, the east, that they migrated from the east, like in the creation story, and I didn't have time to go into this, and I'm just kidding, this is a freebie. In the creation story, God it says in Genesis 3, 24, God drove the man out. He placed him in the east side of the garden of Eden, cherubim, in a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And then in, when Cain and Abel, Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And then I was 
reading this morning, and this is Lot, when he decided to separate from Abraham, he chose the land to the east when he separated from Abraham. East, east, east. And like I said, I didn't have much time to delve into that, but that's like food for thought. So that's your, your homework for this week is like, what's going on in the east? And now these people are migrating from the east. And they say to each other, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Or it says here, tar for mortar. So I've got two different translations going on here. And so, now the Israelites, they would build with stone. This is a nice historical fact. And the Babylonians, they build with brick. And the Israelites were familiar with the Babylonian ziggurats, which are large pyramids, like steps, towers. And they were constructed of mud brick for the interior and baked brick for the exterior, and the, because baked brick was more durable than mud brick. And the, the tar for mortar is, was a really durable mortar to hold it all together. So here we have the Israelites who are now using like construction methods of the Babylonians and they get them all they get themselves all into a mess so but they're determined to build a city where they can gather in one place without having to obey God's command which can be found in Genesis 9 1 which was to replenish the earth that's our command is to replenish the earth and in verse 4 it says that the tower da -da -da, Let's build a tower with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Now God's response to that reference, the heavens, it's a reflection of the people's ambition, I think, to breach the gulf between the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. Essentially, you're trying to build up to get up to heaven, right? And rather than depending on God to make their name great, because they say they want to make their, that we can um, make a name for ourselves who don't go out you know, like, especially when I graduated high school, I thought, okay, no, watch out, world, I'm coming to make a name for myself. You know, we're all trying to do that. Who don't try to make a name for themselves at one time or another? But they're determined to make a name for themselves. And the end of verse 4, uh, I, I used a different translation when I did this, so I'm not matching up here. Verse 4. We will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God had called them to replenish the earth, and so they're completely missing the call here. They're essentially saying, you know what? The Lord, let's all just gather together. Let's build this city. Let's build up to, to the heavens, and we're all going to live together in this kumbaya city that we're going to build. And, and verse 5, the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the children of man had built, and the Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And so, it says, too, that, I really, I'm so sorry about you. I usually use the NIV, and I didn't. Um, then, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And that was a little bit perplexing to me. Like, is, there, is, is what is God saying here? So, the Lord comes down from the heavens. To the earthly realm to inspect this city and tower and i think the irony of this is is they're building this thing to try to get up to heaven right but the text itself says no the lord had to come down to where they are so they weren't even close to trying to get up to heaven and so the lord comes down to expect to inspect this in what seems grand i think sometimes from our standpoint Sometimes we build our own little kingdoms and what we've got going on. We think it's a really big, a big deal, but in all honesty, in the shadow of the Lord Almighty, it's really not that big of, big of a thing or big of a deal. And so their prideful rebellion of the people of Babel is much like the prideful rebellion in the garden. That's where it all started was back in the garden, right? When they had pride and they wanted to be like God and, and sin entered the world and both of these rebellions, though, they seek to rise above human limitation and really assume godly privileges. And I think all too often, we too, we try to assume godly privileges and we try to take things into our own hands and manipulate things so that they work out in a certain way for us without really taking into consideration that the God of all creation who is looking down on us 
is looking down on us and he has a plan for our lives and yet he, I think sometimes he's looking down kind of chuckling as we're trying to figure things out on our own. And as it said that, that it was going to be impossible, um, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. I don't think God was really concerned about them taking over at all. That's not, that's not what's being said here. It can be read that way, but if you look at Psalms 2, verses 1 through 4, awesome. This is what the psalmist wrote. So this is why I say I don't think that God was real concerned about people taking over. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So God is looking down at us being fools down here, and he laughs. Because when, when we are plotting and when we're scheming. So the, the issue here and the problem here isn't that the people are somehow going to storm the gates of heaven and take power from God. The issue here is that if they're allowed to succeed in what they're trying to do, they might be encouraged to engage in even more rebellion. And then I think what could potentially happen here, if you know, if you read in Genesis a little bit before this with Noah and the ark, what happened? God floods the land and he wipes out all the evil people. And so this is actually an act of mercy where God is intervening so that we don't have a Noah's ark all over again. Or in, in you know the, the rainbow, the, God promised He put a bow in the sky so that He would never flood the earth again. However, you know who knows what people. That's a total not right, but we don't need to go down there. But anyway, because I was going to say, some people say it's going to be fire, it's going to be volcanoes, it's going to be you know eruptions and all. I don't know. Whatever it is, I'm going to heaven, so it don't really matter to me. Um, we'll just let it burn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but God disciplines his people and he has things that he puts in place and as it says in, in verse 8 so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left the build, from building the city and one of the people's primary objective in building the city in a tower was really essentially to avoid being dispersed from, from the face of the whole earth like we are told that we're to go forth and make disciples of all nations, right? And here we have, they, they were trying to fight against what God was telling them to do, which was to reproduce and, and to just be dispersed over the whole face of the earth. And they end up being scattered anyways, because when God, God gets what God wants, whether we comply or not. And so they're forced to comply with the command to replenish the earth. And being scattered, they can't, they can't pursue the building of their little city anymore, their fancy little buildings and, and, and towers. And what can we take from that? Is that sin leads to scatteredness, and it leads to brokenness, and it leads to broken relationships. And while sin sometimes brings us these initial gains that are just amazing, right? That's... Well, you think about like, okay, somebody who's dealing drugs, they do it to make a lot of money, you make a lot of money, and then the next thing you know, somebody's narking on you, and you end up going to prison for, for uh, a few years, and you lose part of your life. But sin is always fun in the beginning. I can think of things in my life that I've done, and it's always fun in the beginning. But it also sows the seeds of destruction when we start allowing that darkness into our lives, or seeds of destruction that are being planted in our lives. Because God is not, he'll allow you to get so far, and then he's going to yank you right back. And he's going to spank your little bottom. I think more people, more kids in today's society, you know, squat on the bottom. My, my parents spanked me. And, and I turned all over, right? <laughs> <laughs> so verse 9, that is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, Acts 2 in the New Testament, it tells us of Pentecost, and Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. It was the day when 
the church celebrates and remembers when the Holy Spirit was given, when a wind rushed in and flames of fire fell on them and they were speaking in different languages. So Acts 2 tells us of Pentecost when the barriers of language were breached by the grace of God and when God's people were given the Holy Spirit. And I think that connects here because these folks who were dispersed all over the faces of the earth and now speak in all these different languages and were told by Jesus to go forth and make disciples teaching what we learn, baptizing and teaching people about Jesus. That's not just for pastors or worship leaders. That is for all of us here in this room, the gift of the Holy Spirit is for all of us here in this room. And we take that for granted. We really do. We get so caught up in our own mess and our own, oh, woe is me, kind of thing. But yet, on the day of Pentecost, God took this small group of frightened and puzzled and really highly uneducated men and women, and he gave them the Holy Spirit, and they became a force to be reckoned with. We here at Rectify Church could be a force to be reckoned with if we would live into the anointing of God that has been placed on our lives and stop living for the world and start giving to God what the world is trying to replace it with, if that makes sense. We forget the source of our blessings and, and we take these things for granted. And, and we have a tendency to really forget how broken the world is. And we live in these unrealistic expectations and we become naive when it comes to temptation we think I can handle just a little bit I can hang around with these people I don't I can say no you know what you may say no once you may say but you're not gonna say no forever I guarantee it there is nothing more than the enemy wants than to pull you back in and to just ravage you we forget that we've not only been blessed to be recipients of God's grace, but we're called to be tools of that grace and to share that grace with other people and to love other people and to be Jesus to other people and even maybe just smile at people sometimes. How many, you ever walk down the sidewalk on a busy street? How many people actually look you in the eye and smile? If you're lucky, one. If it's Sally, you get a smile. Sally will smile. I see Dennis not as a Dennis will smile at each other. <laughs> there you go. And we forget that there really is an enemy who's prowling around like, like a roaring lion waiting to divide and devour and destroy your life and to steal away the things that God is doing. And we forget that life can never be found in physical creation. We look for things of the world to bring us peace and to bring us happiness, and we're constantly looking for the next great thing. When we have exactly what we need right here in your heart, you have the Spirit of God in you. How cool is that? Amen. Yeah. And we forget that we have been created and that God loves us and we're created in the image of God. But yet there is a war that is raging for your heart. And sometimes I think, too, that that war that we have and that battle that we have, a lot of times it's, it's within our own minds. And it's within our own hearts. And we're our own worst enemies when it comes to finding freedom. And every day we make a choice. And we attach our hopes and our dreams to something. Every single day of your lives, when you wake up, you're attaching your hopes and dreams to something. Is it something of the world, or is it something that God has placed in your path? And the radical existence of God is preached each and every day. I pray every morning, Lord, give me eyes to see you. It's seen in a sunset or a sunrise. And it's seen in the power of a storm. You ever sit out on the porch and just watch a storm roll in? Or the wings of a hummingbird. We have a feeder on our porch, and every now and again, one will fly by, and there's those things are miraculous little buggers. They're so cool. 
and or the magnitude of a mountain top and seeing a mountain or the whisper of a breeze a gentle breeze on your cheek the laughter of a child or one of my favorites is the sizzling sound of a steak on a grill with some sauteed mushrooms next to it <laughs> that's good i tell you what sauteed mushrooms are my jam and we work so hard to deny God's existence because it's visible everywhere. But we get so caught up in our own heads and our own minds that we miss it. And, and we, we let our feelings dictate us. And we, we, we are people, when we live in our feelings, we tend to make mistakes. When you get lonely, when you get bored. Boredom is like an enemy. It's a total enemy. That's why I think it would like... I don't know, take up crochet, right? <laughs> like something, something to keep your hands busy and your mind busy. Do a crossword puzzle. But living, and I can honestly say that I love being a Christian, but yet there's aspects of the Christian life that can also be really, really tough too. Like it can be tough to get out of bed and to go to church. It took you, it took effort to get here. It took me effort to get here. And I have to be here. Like there's, there's some weeks I say to Dennis on the drive home, you know, honey, if I didn't have to be there, I don't know, I would have went. <laughs> because, you know, you're just feeling so bad. It takes effort to open your Bible and to read and study scripture. But we'll flip out our phone and we'll scroll through Facebook for an hour, two hours, three hours, and then we're down some rabbit hole and then those little reels that they have on there and then all of a sudden you're watching like a bazillion dog videos like and then an hour later i look up and dennis is gone to bed and i'm watching pug videos <laughs> so and i'm speaking to myself here like i need to be more diligent to give my first efforts to god and then after i give after i give my time to god then i can watch some dog videos <laughs> I've heard it, but otherwise, yeah. So it's difficult to spend time in prayer, to be faithful with our giving, to, to tithe, and to keep our thoughts pure, and to keep our eyes on what's good, or to avoid negativity. That's a good one. It's so hard to avoid negativity, because misery loves company, and who don't love a good gossip story? And we are fed the lie that obscenity and profanity and drugs and violence and promiscuity are normal. It, it, I feel so bad for my, when my grandkids come into this world. I think, Lord, have mercy on what these kids are growing up with today. It is nothing. I remember being in the fifth, sixth grade in elementary school, and it was controversial if somebody kissed someone on the cheek. Right. That was like a big deal. Oh my word, so and so kissed somebody out behind the soccer net. You know, that was, but now, hokey smokes. And so evil isn't somewhere that's like out there. It's, it's in our hearts and it's in our minds. And if we really wanted to be rebellious, <coughs> if you really want to be a rebel, and I was a pretty good rebel growing up. I, I like, I like being rebellious, but now I get to be rebellious for Jesus, so it's different. But if you really want to be a rebel, <coughs> read your Bible. Because in all honesty, there was not very many people who were doing it. And as believers, if we each even committed five minutes a day to this, we would see revival rock this city and rock this county in this state in this world if we would just give god a couple of minutes a day a chapter a day Unbeliever. 10 verses a day that's all it takes because once you start to feed on it and chew on it you'll be amazed as to how much You'll want more and more. You'll let this be your addiction. And there's also a war that's being raged against your identity. 
And it used to be easy to say that it's for women, it's against your identity, because there's all these makeup videos and tutorials and, and ways that tell us that we're not pretty enough and that we don't, you know, you don't have the right outfit, you need to be cute, your hair needs to be a certain way. But now it's the same for guys. You all hear the same stuff too, and you see the same things too. There's a war for your identity. It's telling you that your worth is found in something that, that the world wants to give you. But in all honesty, we are created in the image of God, and God does not create junk. He does not create junk. And when you look in the mirror and you see your face looking back at you and you smile and you just see who you are in that mirror, that just makes God happy. Because he's like, I created that. Look at John's smile. Don't you look good? Look at Mike's smile. Look at him. Look at Mike's laugh. Don't you look good? I created that. I'm so happy. I just delight in my voice. And that's what God does. But we're so busy thinking, oh man, I'm so fat, or I put on so much weight, and and um, and granted, you know, I'm on, I do Weight Watchers, which is about killing me. I've been in six months. And, but it's not because I want, it's, it's because I want to be healthy and I want to be able to, to raise my grandchildren and I don't want heart problems and my family diabetes is in my family. I want to be able to raise my grandkids. It's, it's, and so yeah, we need to take care of the temples that God gave us. But there's the aspect that like, we need to stop being so hard on ourselves and really just start, like, I love hair when hair is here. She's a little quiet tonight, but I love her energy and her spunk. And what if that childlike faith, y'all, like there, there was a, a, a meme or a picture of a little girl standing out in the rain and she's just like going like this. And I thought, you know, where is that girl gone? Where is that little boy gone that likes to run through puddles and run in the rain and splash and make a mess and, and we're, we lose sight of it, and we, we try to be so serious all the time. Yeah, see that laughter? That's, God delights in that. So it's time to stop defending what Jesus died for, what, what he died to destroy, and we need to start walking in, in freedom. We really do. And we're gonna we're gonna have communion. So Tim, you wanna hand out the cups? Now Pentecost is very reminiscent of the Last Supper. I think I think there's a connection there. In both instances, the disciples are together in a house for what proves to be a really important event. And at the Last Supper, the disciples witness the end of the Messiah's earthly ministry as he asked them to remember him after his death until he returns. And then at Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit, the disciples witnessed the birth of this New Testament church and the coming of the Holy Spirit that indwells in all believers. And we've done this before, and I'm going to do it again. So 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes about the seriousness of the Lord's Supper. And we come together in remembrance of what God has for us, of what God has done for us. Harry, you're such a good helper, honey. You're awesome. And so 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, meaning Paul, telling them what he passed on to them. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he had took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And this is where Paul gets serious. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so that being said, being that we just talked about rebellion, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes of silence, and maybe, or maybe Paul would even like to come up and, and play some music in the background. Just a couple of minutes for you to take some time to talk to your Heavenly Father, to give over to Him whatever it is that you're carrying that is not yours to carry, so that when we come to the Lord's table and we partake in communion, we come with pure hearts, with open minds, and with hearts that are ready to surrender to Jesus. So Father God, we just thank you so much for the gift of this place and for the gift of this night. And we thank you that you're a God who doesn't give up on his people. Thank you for sending Jesus into this world so that that chasm between us and you could be bridged. Father, we want to come to your table in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you. So, Lord, in this time of silence, I just pray that you hear the prayers of the men and women here in this room who want to give those things over to you. So, Lord, hear our prayers, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. And thank you for the gift of forgiveness that is freely given to those who turn their hearts and minds to you. So we praise you, Jesus. We thank you. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. As often as you partake in it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ.